It's my pleasure to introduce the speaker of the day, Dr. Jyoti Dev. Uh, Dr. Jyoti Dev is an alumni of Toronto Medical College in Mayo Clinic, USA, and has been a pioneer in telemedicine care and diabetic care with a quorum of more than 10,000 patients to his grade. Doctor has the largest number of uh, insulin pump patients in Asia and has presented papers both at national and international levels and has been a speaker at more than 150 CMEs for doctor. Doctor will be speaking on uh, progression and prevention of kidney disease and diabetes, tips, tools and all. Diabetic kidney disease is increasing globally and this rise in the diabetic kidney disease could be attributed to the amazing increase in the number of diabetic patients. As you can notice from this pictorial representation which has appeared in New England Journal of Medicine last year, the blue bars over here are the probable numbers of diabetes patients in the year 2030. And you can see that in India, there is a predicted increase by 150 percentage. And we expect a progressive increase in the number of diabetic kidney disease as well. This is an old one. If you look at the number of subjects undergoing renal replacement therapy or ESRD, diabetes is listing the top. Whereas in the United States recently, over the last two or three years, the diabetic kidney disease progression or rather in terms of numbers have gradually started declining thanks to the newer therapeutic options. Whatever be the reasons for diabetic nephropathy, even in the USA they have noticed that the minorities experience higher than average rates of nephropathy, especially the African Americans, the Pema Indians. And if you look at the global incidence of end-stage renal disease, Asian Indians have a very high prevalence when compared to other ethnic populations. <coughs> this is a funny statement. Only the lucky chronic kidney disease patients reach the stage of end-stage renal disease. What exactly the reason for that? Are they not lucky enough to undergo dialysis or renal transplantation? The reason is very simple. Before the occurrence of ESRD, they die of cardiovascular disease. In other words, there is a close association or very affectionate relationship between cardiovascular diseases and chronic kidney disease. Whether it is rise in creatinine levels or the occurrence of microalbuminuria, there is a proportionate increase by 1.5 to 3.5 times in the occurrence of CBD. An annual mortality from cardiovascular disease is increased 10 to 100 times with the appearance of kidney failure. And the prevalence of earlier stages of CKD is over hundred times that of kidney failure. However, the outcomes of chronic disease, kidney disease can be prevented or delayed by early detection and treatment. This is one study which was presented in the ADA, progression of kidney disease in diabetes patients, the triad study presented by Kingsley and his group. I am just showing a couple of slides, one or two slides. The rate of decline of glomerular filtration rate in diabetic kidney disease varies from 2 to 20 ml per minute per year. The patient characteristics associated with variation in the rate of decline of GFR have not been fully elucidated. What is the conclusion of this tiny study? It is very simple. If you look at the progressive decline in the renal function that we are observing in most of our diabetes patients, in this study, they have found that there is an association between this and reduced renal function, presence of albuminuria, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and even the presence of retinopathy. In other words, 
if we can meticulously or closely take care of all these parameters, hypertension, dyslipidemia, and associated retinopathy, recognition management, albuminuria management, most probably you are going to prevent further progression or postpone the so-called dialysis or renal transplantation. What about serum creatinine? Serum creatinine is the one parameter that we are always looking at. Unfortunately, it is a relatively late marker of diabetic kidney disease. <coughs> Moreover, variations in the calibration, improper standardization of machines will either give you a high creatinine value or a low creatinine value, which is a very major limitation to the day-to-day -day use of this parameter. As physicians, we have all observed that there is an inter or an intra-laboratory variation in the estimation of serum creatinine. What about the screening for diabetic nephropathy? How can we screen a subject for the occurrence of diabetic nephropathy? It is very simple. It doesn't require much time or money. <coughs> Just measure the blood pressure in a diabetes patient. The normal BP should be less than 130 by 80. And what about the urine albumin excretion? No, the normal urine albumin excretion will be less than 30 milligram per day or, <coughs> or less than 20 microgram per minute. And in microalbuminuria, it will be between 20 and 200 micrograms per minute. And this can be done annually, beginning at diagnosis and type 1 annually and 5 years post-diagnosis. If you look at the stages of kidney disease, most of the stages have been learned in type 1 diabetes. And uh, this is one such sort of a classification we are all familiar with. In stage 1, there is a hyperfiltration and the kidney increases in size. There is a transient increase in the glomerular filtration rate. In stage 2, the glomerular begin to show damage and microalbuminuria occurs. In stage 3, the urine albumin excretion is more than 200 microgram per minute with blood levels of creatinine and urea increasing. And you see that the blood pressure also starts increasing in this stage. However, it is reversible up to this stage or rather you can prevent further progression with aggressive management. By stage 4, there is large amount of proteinuria there is a concomitant appearance of high blood pressure and stage 5 is <coughs> end stage renal disease when the GFR is less than 10 ml per minute. No CME on diabetes is complete without this slide on good gly glycemic control reducing the occurrence of complications both microvascular and macrovascular. We have the landmark studies Rated here. We have the DCCT on type 2 diabetes. We have UKPDS on the other side, the largest and longest study on type 2 diabetes. And reduction in the glycated hemoglobin levels will result in retinopathy reduction, nephropathy reduction, neuropathy reduction. So there is no doubt, and we have sufficient statistical evidence that tight glycemic control can prevent the progression of microvascular complications in diabetes. But what about the ideal insulin replacement pattern once diabetic kidney disease sets in? When there is a chronic kidney disease, we all know that metformin is contraindicated. You cannot give metformin. Because once creatinine value is above 1.5, there is increased risk for lactic acidosis with metformin. And most of the sulfurias can get accumulated with the occurrence of kidney failure. And in chronic kidney disease, there is fluid retention and if you continue to administer glitazones, glitazones are a controversial drug now. Again, 
there is more of occurrence of edema. And this is the ideal insulin replacement pattern as published by the ADA, the base cell bonus regimen. Okay, this is one screenshot from our diabetes telemanagement system, our software. And here we are representing the A1C values of a subject when he got registered a couple of years back, when the A1C used to be 11 percentage, and the sequential values and the most recent one is 5.5. And this periodic sequential fall in A1C as seen in our DKMS program, we use it as a motivational tool for the patients during their physical visits to the hospital. And what another revolution in diabetes care recently is with the introduction of sensor augmented insulin pumps. And this is one such sensor which we call mini link sensor which function like a glucometer and via a wireless mechanism will transmit the blood glucose values onto the insulin pump. So we have tools with us to manage blood glucose values and maintain very low A1C values. And this is how the natural history of a diabetic nephropathy looks like when we are not aggressive in the treatment of glycemia or hypertension. This is a very simple cartoon representation of microalbuminuria to start with. And once the excretion of urinary albumin is above 300, from 30 to 300 is microalbumin, above 300 it is over albuminuria. And over the years, if you look at the duration of diabetes along the x-axis, after the initial hike in the GFR value, there is a progressive decline in the GFR value. We can see that ESRD will occur roughly 15 or 20 years after the appearance of microalbuminuria, where you can probably intervene and prevent it. And the association between albuminuria and cardiovascular diseases is multifactorial. Probably there is a genetic predisposition, endothelial dysfunction, associated hypertension and you can probably treat with drugs hypertension, you can aggressively manage dyslipidemia and also hyperglycemia. And one or two slides on the pathological process leading to glomerular injury and proteinuria in hyperglycemia where there is increased advanced glycation end products and there is increase in the angiotensin 2 which leads on to more constriction of the efferent arteriole, our old MBBS classes and this efferent arteriole constriction will result in increased pressure inside the glomeruli, intraglomerular pressure or intraglomerular hypertension which leads on to extravasation of protein, you can see the protein in the Bowen's capsule and eventually there is a damage which is happening in the nephrons in the diabetic kidney disease. The consequences will be twofold. One is functional, the decline in the GFR, occurrence of proteinuria and the structural damage of the nephron will result in glomerular basement membrane changes, expansion of the mesangial matrix, glomerular sclerosis, tuberointerstitial fibrosis. And uh, this is a busy slide showing the pathways leading the progressive renal failure, glomerular hypertension, then increased filtration of plasma proteins from the plasma onto the urine, and there is increase in the absorption of proteins from the proximal tubule. It aggravates this oxidative damage, more production of reactive oxygen species, more production of cytokine, activation of inflammatory markers influx of monocytes and macrophages, progressive decline in the glomerular filtration rate, eventually leading on to renal scarring. What is the treatment of nephropathy? Obviously, treatment of glycemia, but more important or probably equally important will be the early use of antihypertensive agents, either ACI or ARBs. And once end-stage renal disease is established, we have several therapeutic options. I am not going into the details of anything. Diabetes is expensive to treat. 
These are some of the Indian studies. Type 2 diabetes without any complications. A patient has to spend Indian rupees 6,200 to 10,700. Along with hypertension, there is an additional cost involved in the management of hypertension. And most of these patients are having dyslipidemia. And according to the new IDF guidelines, we are also supposed to give statins and aspirins along with this. Cost of type 2 diabetes in India, patients without complications, when they go through the natural instead of diabetes, they spend 18% lower cost. However, when the patient is developing three or more complications, there is a 48% higher cost. And with the onset of chronic kidney disease requiring dialysis, they spend 14 times more than those without any associated complications. If you go back to the economic analysis of United Kingdom Prospective Diabetes Study, it was earlier published that the economic analysis shows that additional costs of intensive management are largely offset by significant reductions in the cost of treating complications of diabetes. Though it is said that intensive management of diabetes is three to four times more expensive than conventional management. And this is a slide that I usually show in most of my CME lectures on the IDF publication of three levels of care for diabetes subjects. We have the minimal care, which I am comparing to a travel in the bullock cart. We have the standard care, and we have the most comprehensive care, like traveling in a Porsche Benz car. And at least physicians uh, in India should be striving for a standard care in which we are managing the glycemia, if possible, including the glycemic excursions, managing the hypertension with one, two, or three or more drugs, and managing dyslipidemia with standards, aiming at a A1C value of at least below 6.5. We have guidelines from ADA and IDF on the treatment goals, but if you go by the International Diabetes Federation, the target for us is a fasting plasma of below 110, a postprandial of below 145, that is two hours after food, <coughs> and a glycated hemoglobin value of less than 6.5. This is an achievable goal. And there are a lot of articles on minimal glucose variations coming up. Glucose variability considered in combination with A1C as an independent factor may be a more reliable indicator of glucose control than considering A1C alone. This we call it as glucose excursions. This is a CDMS of one of our patients. And you can see that the blood glucose variations in every five minutes. This is a record, uh, a printout of a patient measured separately on several days a week, each color denoting a day. And you can see that majority of the values are above the target between 70 and 140. And this we call it as glycemic excursions. And glycemic excursions has to do something with diabetes and the coagulation and vascular events. These glucose excursions will result in oxidative stress, leading out increased production of F2 isoprostein, 8 iso BGFT alpha. And this in turn will result in increase in platelet activation, reflected by an increase in the urinary excretion of platelet derived thromboxane B2. And this will result in increase in the level of PI1 levels and increase in the vascular events. So that is one reason why we should be targeting the glycemic excursions as well and not the A1C levels alone. And every physician will have a nightmare when we are aiming at a intensive glycemic control, though we know that it is going to prevent nephropathy or retinopathy. And this nightmare is the hypo, which can occur at night or during the daytime or during the sleep. And to an extent, newer devices can alleviate this fear if they are properly used. This is another screenshot from our DTMS where we began managing the dinner or post-dinner or bedtime glucose value at levels close to 300 and now it is around 100. 
and our patients on regular DTMS follow up, majority of them are achieving very low A1C levels. And we have presented in the ADA, and this is from the journal Diabetes, available in ADA website, on achieving desirable glycemic targets without the risk of hypoglycemia using a teletitration program. What about the blood pressure? This is one study which was published long ago when the decline in the GFR has been studied when the antihypertensive drugs were included. You can see that the decline in the GFR to start with was 0.94 ml per minute per month and with the initiation of proper antihypertensive therapy it has come down to 0.29 ml per minute. So that is the power of introduction of antihypertensive treatment in preventing the progression of diabetic nephropathy rather than focusing on managing glycemia alone. Blood pressure treatment goals in patients with diabetes in general it should be less than 130 by 80 and in patients with nephropathy a lower if possible if feasible because that is more better. There are a couple of uh, studies which are always being discussed uh, with angiotensin 2 receptor blockers. One such study is RANAAL and we have another one with Irbisartan in diabetic nephropathy trial. And here losartan 50 to 100 milligram is compared with placebo. I am not going to, into the details. Anyway, the primary endpoint of these studies were to look at the doubling of serum creatinine and the end renal disease or death. And we have seen from this study that there is a reduction by 16 percentage when losartan were used and a reduction by 20 percent with irbisartan 150 and when irbisartan versus amlodipine it was less than 23 percentage. And in the IRMA study when irbisartan 150 milligram was compared with 300 milligram there was an amazing difference. You can see from here that the development of clinical proteinuria in the study subjects with microalbinuria were reduced by 39 percentage in 150 milligram group versus by 70 percentage in the 300 milligram group. And that is one reason why most of us are preferring urbisartan 300 milligram in preventing proteinuria if microalbuminuria is detected early in our diabetes subjects. And this is again back to DCCT, the relationship between A1C and the risk of microvascular complications. This is like the takeoff of a flight. You can see that here is the glycated hemoglobin of 6 which is close to normal or an average plasma glucose of 135 milligram. And with increase in the glycated hemoglobin levels, there is a progressive increase in the occurrence of all these microvascular complications. In other words, there is nothing called a normal A1C value. Nowadays it is said that A1C is a continuous variable. Lower the A1C, the best. Glycohemoglobin as a determinant of increased fibrinogen concentrations and low grade inflammation in apparently healthy non-diabetic individuals. Evans is gradually evolving as an investigative tool which can be used even in subjects without diabetes since it can evolve as an inflammatory marker. This observation supports the idea that glycohemoglobin might have an effect on fibrinogen concentrations in both genders and on high sensitive CRP in men. We have another publication which is again related to a dramatic response of painful peripheral neuropathy with the use of insulin pumps in type 2 diabetes. We don't know whether this is applicable in nephropathy because in DCCT when the blood sugars were very high and when we were aggressively managing the blood glucose levels there was a actually a worsening of retinopathy rather than a recovery from retinopathy. So it should be a slow and steady titration. And this is one small video on the real-time insulin pump in one of the type 2 diabetes subjects. You can see that in the modern real-time insulin pumps 
rather than having the pump and infusion set alone, we have the insulin pump which displays the blood glucose values and it changes every five minutes. Ultimately, we have three targets to look at managing the diabetes. We have the A1C, that is the average blood glucose. We have the blood pressure and the cholesterol. And we have set goals for all the three. However, we have some more additional targets. In a <coughs> study which was published in New England Journal of Medicine, pharmacological treatment was actually administered for all the four. Glucose, blood pressure, lipids and microalbumin. And there were, <coughs> excuse me, there was an aggressive behavioral modification therapy in terms of educating the patients on exercise, diet and smoking. And you can see the odds ratio progression. And we have all the microvascular complications as well as autonomy neuropathy favoring intensive management of all these parameters. However, recently there was a controversy on intensive glycemic management when the ACCORD study was published, Action to Control Cardiovascular Disease and Diabetes. And there was a little controversy on more number of subjects in the intensive arm dying early. And now, with the publication of advanced and other studies, we are still sure and the consensus is again towards aggressive management of all the parameters. However, individualization of treatment goals are essential, mandatory. All patients cannot undergo the same management. You cannot aim for the same A1C levels in all the subjects. It depends on several parameters. You have to look at the coexisting illnesses. You have to look at whether there is an associated autonomy neuropathy where the patient is over the age of 65 years with multiple comorbid illnesses, where you have to probably aim at A1Cs which are more than 7 and less than 8. And interventions to decrease the progression of diabetic nephropathy. Our distinguished speaker is going to talk on keto analogs and uh, other modalities of management. Our little experience with keto sterile, we have administered in 42 of our type 2 diabetes patients with creatinine values of above 1.5 and less than 3 and we have administered a dose of 2 tablets 3 times daily they were all put on DTMS follow up very aggressively managed by us and our uh, dietitian because dietitian is having a major role Dr. Inkel will be presenting on that all the patients tolerated the medicine very well I cannot call it a medicine because it is not a drug and 6 months only 4 of these 42 patients progressed to advanced renal failure and I believe that the only limiting factor to the use of ketosterol is the cost because I personally observed that when the patient is forced to take less of ketosterol the creatinine values are again going up so it is a wonderful drug probably can replace uh, dialysis or it can prevent the further progression of nephropathy in chronic kidney disease I would like to conclude like this <coughs> Low average blood glucose values, blood pressures and cholesterol are all achievable. And home blood glucose monitoring has got incredible benefits. Newer gadgets, newer novel therapeutic options are all indispensable for achieving the concept of healthy aging. Because I have observed that chronic kidney disease is more and more seen now in the elderly age group. Usually I show a cartoon at the end of a presentation. And now I have displayed a news which has appeared just now, similar to a cartoon. Thank you very, very much for your patient listening. And the most important is beneficial effect of keto in diabetics or diabetic kidney disease. As you know, diabetic kidney disease to control protein era is a hell of a problem. Even if you put patient on ARBs or combination of ARBs and ACE inhibitor, tight glycemic control, it's very, very difficult to control albumin urea. And keto diet would definitely help you out. And this is the proof. There's a significant reduction in protein urea after patients were put on keto diet. 
Another beneficial effect of keto, it enhances insulin sensitivity. This I had seen myself in many patients where after putting patient on keto analogs, their insulin requirement has come down. Probably it's because of improvement in the nutrition and reduction in the inflammation. But yes, beneficial effect is there. It helps to prevent metabolic acidosis. As you know, in chronic kidney disease, there is a burden of H ion. And the routine essential amino acid supplements sulfur, which has got a high amount of H ions. These are not supplemented with keto analogs which prevents metabolic acidosis and it has got a very beneficial effect. It prevents protein degradation, it prevents osteoporosis and this is the proof. Again a meta-analysis which shows keto analog improves metabolic acidosis. It corrects dyslipidemia. The theory is that metabolic acidosis is corrected because there is reduction in protein area which leads to correction of dyslipidemia and this is also proven with the one study where they have shown after putting patient on keto analogs, there is an increased HDL level, a reduction in LDL, significant reduction in total homocysteine and reduction in CRP levels. So which indicates that keto diet also helps to correct dyslipidemia. It corrects hyperparathyroidism. Basically this keto salts are supplemented with the calcium. So calcium is supplemented plus there is a correction of metabolic acidosis which results in improvement of serum calcium then reduction in phosphates and reduction in serum parathyroid hormone levels. This is not only theory, again proven with the bone histology. After patient was put on a keto diet, this is a normal bone histology which improves significantly after the keto diet therapy. So that itself is a proof which indicates that keto diet helps to prevent hyperparathyroidism. Now the role of keto analog in the epidemic of diabetes. So, uh, this Professor Teplan has shown in 2005 that it reduces inflammatory parameters, reduces insulin resistance, it reduces erythropoietin requirement, reduces fat or reduction in weight, reduces protein area and it improves nutritional markers. So, these are beneficial effects in diabetic kidney disease. Does keto really work is a basic question to need to be answered and is a comparison with the meta-analysis. Low protein diet and essential amino acids which are available in market at a cheaper cost, they could maintain the renal function only for two years. Low protein diet with keto analogs could maintain renal function for almost five years. The latest study is published by Zakar who has shown the time taken from CKD to ESRD is prolonged by 40% with keto diet. But at the same time, what he has shown, the cost of keto diet is one-tenth of dialysis cost per annum. If patient lines up with the ESRD and goes on hemodialysis, the cost is much more on the higher side. Prolongation of renal replacement therapy. This is a very, very popular question asked by patients to me. Can we prolong dialysis? Yes, you can try it out. It is possible. What you have to do? Put patients on very low protein diet. Very low protein diet means only 0.3 mg per kg per day. Combined with keto analogs, and this study has shown that it could prevent renal replacement therapy or dialysis for almost two years. And that's a quite a significant period. This is my experience with keto diet. Few of my chronic kidney disease patients put on keto diet and look at their serum creatinine levels from 2002 to almost 2007-8. The significant observation in this, the patients whose creatinine level was below 5, they have shown improvement in the renal function their creatinine further dropped. When to start keto? Well, the consensus says that when GFR falls below 60 ml per minute or in diabetic kidney disease, when there is evidence of microalbumin area, one should initiate patient on keto therapy. Can anybody make out what is this? Thank you very much for kind attention.
you are not dancing, I am going to ask you this. <laughs> because I, uh, in our practice, because I understood that the uh, number of tablets that we should be using should be close to 10 or 12 per day. When you consider uh, the weight of the interval. Yeah, uh, ideal dose is one tablet per 5 kg of water. The average intake weight if you consider somewhere around 50, it comes to 9 to 10 tablets. Okay. This tablets, it's not mandatory that it should be given 3, 3, 3 or 4, 4, 4, something like that. He has to consume that amount of tablets in 24 hours. Whether he takes one hourly, he takes half hourly or he takes one at a time, no problem. Okay. Total doses should go in a day. And as you have correctly pointed out, if you give uh, medication at the doses which are lesser than the recommended, they do not work. Yeah. And better not take it. Because I had tried this one TDS, two TDS and all that, because it was a popular demand from the patients. But I had seen within two months you can find a difference. Within two months. And even if you stop ketotherapy in between, the patient who is doing very well, you stop ketotherapy in between, suddenly, uh, suddenly his kidney function will go down. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. I did, I hope so, yeah. Because this looks like lifelong mm -hmm. thing it goes on dialysis. Yeah, yeah. Dialysis also it has got a beneficial effect, but well, it depends on the patient's financial condition. If he affords, better to continue. If he cannot, then he can stop. It's, it's only a key to analog. Uh, we cannot expect any drug drug interaction, right? There no, won't be no. any interaction at all. These are because basically essential oh, amino acids. Yeah, yeah. So there is no question of any adverse events. Do you have anybody who cannot tolerate this because of some other reasons? Well, the basic well, uh, and the most common complaint, as you have correctly said, is the smell, yeah. then gastric uh, upset, stomach upset, there is a belching, nausea, and all that. I tell them to take the medicine after food, okay. after games. And you increase the gap. Suppose he is supposed to take three tablets at a time. I ask him to take every 15 minutes or every 20 minutes. It's better tolerable. Other than taking three tablets at a time, the size is quite big. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's something like, a, you know, uh, vitamin B supplementation. You keep on getting belching sensation and all that. If it takes one tablet at a time for at a gap of 10, 15 minutes, it's much better. Because I don't have any patient who has tolerated this drug. So uh, the officials have told me that this is a probable limitation in the use of uh, this medication. But I have no patients who have told me that I cannot take it because of the belching or abdominal discomfort or because of nausea. They are tolerating it very well. But probably when we go up in higher terms of yeah, higher doses, they are probably going to develop Usually it. problem starts after uh, say 9 tablets per day. Oh, okay, right, right. Mm -hmm. See, quite a big size. Then they start complaining. So, uh, for an average uh, person who is 65 kilograms weight, uh, I mean, on an average, how many tablets you are using in your practice per, per day? Just divide age by five. So, you are using the optimal the dosage. Optimal dosage. So, you mean but to say that lower dosages are not useful? Not useful. Where the dosage below nine tablets per day in India, are not useful. At least minimum should be 9 tablets. This is not shown in any study. This is my experience. Yeah, yeah. The ideal recommended dose is 1 tablet for 5 years. But in Indian side, it's in up to 9 tablets, it, it works very well. But even single tablet below that, 8 tablets or something like that, it doesn't work. Minimum is 9. 9 and above. Okay, thank you. Of course, you can interact with both of them during the dinner. And uh, may I request Sananjay to give a moment to Thank you very much, Doctor. My pleasure. My pleasure.
the information is related to the product and everything is given on our company website and also when our field people do work, uh, please be free to ask for the catalog.